A Missouri basketball target looks like a perfect fit on paper, but there is one problem. He's from Lawrence, Kansas. I'll tell you if that matters to me or not. Coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and a former Missourian Tribune guy turned trader, turned back into the sports world. I'm podcasting, what, 895 episodes deep now. Thanks for joining me once again on today's program. We're going to talk about Dennis Gates officially needing a new assistant coach and By God, maybe the NCAA actually listens to me after all. It feels good to be heard and seen. But you know what? Before we start off the program, I do want to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. And are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. And again, I want to start off today's program talking about a Mizzou target who on paper looks like a heck of a target, a really good fit for Missouri. Obviously, with Nick Honor and Sean East departing the program, only Anthony Robinson, at least at this point, we're assuming Anthony Robinson will be back next year. But obviously, Missouri needs a lead guard, and it seems like Zeke Mayo at first glance, really fits the bill from South Dakota State. The Jackrabbits, a 6'4 guard, averaged 18 points a game last year on efficient scoring and, and a fair amount of assists as well. But again, as I pointed out in my open, there's a slight problem here. Yes, Zeke is from Lawrence, Kansas. And if that doesn't send a slight shiver down your spine, then, well, you're not a real Missouri Tiger fan. And I'll be honest with you, it does sound like he might be Kansas bound, maybe NBA bound too, but it does sound like Missouri is very interested at the very least. So at the risk of being put on the power Mizzou list of secret beakers, I got to be honest, I don't really care if he's from Lawrence, Kansas or not. Because here's the thing, what I care about most of all is Missouri being good at basketball. And certainly there have been guys from Kansas who have been true sons before. I don't know, how far do we want to slice this? But here's the thing, if he does eventually go to Kansas, he being Zeke Mayo, pronouns pal, then he's officially dead to me. So is that a rational take by yours truly? No, it's not rational at all but it is consistent. So your mileage may vary, as they say. Maybe you would not take somebody who probably grew up as somebody who favored Kansas if was not an outright Kansas fan, to be honest with you. Would you take somebody like that? I don't know. If he's turning down Kansas for Missouri, that sounds like a true son to me. So again, we'll just have to see what happens here. In my opinion, anybody who signs on the dotted line for Missouri is okay with me. It, it just in in terms of where they're from geographically. I'm not going to discriminate that harshly. But again, if he goes to Kansas, dead to me. And speaking of Mizzou basketball, quite a bit of news to get to on the assistant coaching front. And I do think this is important for Mizzou and Dennis Gates here heading in to year three. According to Gabe DeArmond, Nutt has officially been moved to the role of assistant to the head coach slash senior advisor. So this opens up one spot on the bench here for Dennis Gates. And this is not being made for performance reasons. Of course, this is being made for health reasons as Coach Nutt continues to recover and hopefully win that battle with cancer. Obviously, once again, all the best wishes and thoughts and prayers in the world out to Coach Nutt. But the bottom line is now 
he need Dennis Gates needs a new full time assistant, and to me, you got to be looking for a guy who has some defensive. Basically, defense is his is his forte. That's what I'd be looking for in an assistant coach because, in terms of recruiting, I think Dennis Gates and C. Y. Young and Kyle Smith Peters pretty much have that covered. It would seem to me, Smith Peters, for instance, the lead recruiter on Anor Botang, the the highest rated recruit for Missouri coming in this season, also the prize of and only recruit so far in the 25 class Columbia Missouri's Aaron Rowe here goes to goes to school here in Tolton High School both of those guys were Smith Peters recruits and CY Young obviously brings in a lot of talent as well so I just don't think recruiting in and of itself is the real concern here if I'm hiring a new assistant coach and I'm Dennis Gates and by the way speaking of Kyle Smith Peters Notable here that Southern Illinois has hired a new coach, a new head coach, by the way, and it's not Kyle Smith-Peters. There was some talk in the last few weeks that Smith-Peters was a strong candidate there, and if he would have gotten that job or been offered that job, it would have been hard to see him turning it down. So I would say that's good news for Missouri as Kyle Smith-Peters has obviously been an important part of this staff. And speaking of leadership, well, it's not just the basketball team that's going to be looking for a new assistant. It's now been well over a month since Desiree Reed Francois surprisingly departed her post as Missouri's athletic director to take the same position at Arizona. And frankly, at this point, the fact that there's no news whatsoever, again, it just seems like another reason to question Missouri and its leadership. I really think that's fair now at this point in the process. It's almost April. Francois departed February 19th. Really, you know, all, here's all I know. No matter how long it takes, Missouri leadership better get somebody in charge who knows what they're doing has some type of forward-looking vision for where this sport is going. To use the old Wayne Gretzky phrase, skate where the puck is going and not where it is right now because there's so much change, not only that has happened in the last few years in college sports, still so much to come, so much change still on the horizon. Will there be even more merging? Obviously, the Pac-12 just basically went under. Who would have seen that coming just a couple years ago even? So who knows where the heck all of this is going in a couple years is, is my point. So with all this change on the horizon for all of sports, Missouri better get its leadership right because if they don't, that puts even more pressure on this 2024 football team. Brian Smith and I talked a lot about yesterday how it's such a huge season for the program and Eli Drinkwitz in general this coming 24 to be able to capitalize on the back of a big time 23 would just mean everything really not only the football program but just the athletic department in general and if that doesn't happen and if Missouri continues to show poor leadership you know all the good times we've had here in the last couple of years it could come to an end rather quickly momentum is a rather fickle thing, no question about that. And the more you look at it and the more you think about it, it really does seem like the biggest schism of all between the athletic department and Desiree Reed Francois. This is just my own speculation. But it just seems like Desiree wanted to spend a lot more money than the AD and maybe the board of curators, the other leadership elements she wanted to spend more than they were comfortable with, in particular on non-revenue sports, and I would say the North End Zone Complex as well. It seemed like Missouri was talking about doing a sort of ballpark village light concept. Those are my words, but sort of like what Bush Stadium has done in recent years behind their ballpark. Well, have rest a restaurant and uh, shops and that type of thing year-round. To me, that was always a really aggressive concept that I wasn't that big of a fan of. It just seemed like, you know, six, seven home games a year versus 81 for the Cardinals. That's a heck of a difference. I just didn't know that that was the greatest concept in the world. And frankly, maybe the board of curators who I've given a lot of criticism to, maybe they felt the same way. 
I think one thing we saw recently too, a new video board is coming this fall in the north end zone, but it's basically going to be a new board on top of the existing north video board structure. So at least as of now, we're putting off some of that big spending a little bit. And as I've said before, there's also new audio, no new audio system coming here too. So it seems like Missouri's doing a bit of a short term fix here. And frankly, I think I would just keep the video board as is, if that's what you're going to do. If you're going to eventually go to a bigger one, then okay, I, I would just keep the one that currently is there then. But if that's not the plan, if this is, if we're just keeping the same structure, frankly, that's a little disappointing. But that means to me, all that needs to be in the north end zone at this point is the suites. But regardless, I think this whole disagreement, what to do with Hearn Center and all that real estate, how much should we spend on baseball, all that good stuff. You know, honestly, Carrick Jackson might be the biggest loser here of Desiree Reed Francois' departure, to be quite honest. She seemed like maybe the biggest fan of actually going for it in SEC baseball. But regardless, I think the spending, the levels of spending that the rest of Missouri was comfortable with, I think that's kind of ultimately what ended up in her leaving. And coming up, you know, it wasn't a few days ago I made a suggestion about how to lower the risk of collusion in sports and betting. And by golly, it wasn't a day later the NCAA actually listened to me. So let's talk about that here in just a little bit. But first, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. And I have to admit, the Alabama Crimson Tide can only be described as a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves entering the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. And I underestimated them, I have to admit. But after taking down North Carolina in the Sweet 16, they'll look to battle Clemson and earn a trip to the Final Four for the first time in program history. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, and Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. And are you like most of us? Is your bracket already busted? But you want to stay in the game? Well, I'm introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent, and you can play with your friends and not against them. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. You know, I was just thinking, this might be something fun for my father and I to do together because we both have our own specialized knowledge, I would say. That's another beautiful thing about Better Together. Play with a friend, for instance. My dad watches way more golf than I do. Hey, I can just piggyback onto his PGA picks. He can piggyback onto my my NFL and NBA picks. Come on, that's how you're truly better together, in my opinion. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code LOCKEDON for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Play with me in a contest on one of these days. Remember the code LOCKEDON because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. So I talked quite a bit about the Jonte Porter situation the other day on the podcast. And here's the thing. My my solution, my overall thoughts weren't specific to Porter as all. First of all, I think we need to keep an open mind here and realize that Porter has not specifically been accused of anything, first of all. But also just generally about the situation we currently find ourselves in, I really think it might not be a bad idea for all of sports to limit prop betting on on individual players, especially at the NCAA level and obviously even at the NBA level if it's not among star players. 
Now, obviously, hey, if you're going to put props on LeBron James, that guy's worth a billion dollars or something, going to be tough to sway him with any type of betting collusion. But as, as you can see, when it's somebody who's on the fringe of the league, there certainly is a, a financial incentive there at the very least. So the NCAA, not a day after I, I mentioned this possibility, said they're looking into the possibility of getting rid of individual player props, at least working with, you know, the legal, their legal partners, of course, and getting rid of those bets or at the very least limiting them severely, having very low limits on those type of things. And to me, again, you can have the starters in the NBA, have them have props if you want, and you'll probably be fine. But anybody beyond that, and you really are putting yourself at risk here. And by the way, speaking of John Tay Porter, his brother Michael Porter Jr., of course, said that he has no more details than the media does, but he did vouch for his brother saying that John Tay loves the game of basketball. I've obviously known him my whole life. I know what type of dude he is, and I know he's excited to play basketball, and I highly doubt that he would do anything to put that in jeopardy. So there's Michael Porter Jr. talking about his younger brother. I thought it was also interesting here. He went on to describe sort of the new world that we're living in here with so many people not only betting, but just openly doing so. A lot of people knew at the experience as well. He said, especially the last few years, you hear people in the crowd saying what they need you to score tonight or what they don't want you to score. Every night you're disappointing someone. You're disappointing people if you score too much because they may have bet the under or you're disappointing people if you didn't score enough. So it's part of the game now. I think it's obviously a dangerous habit. It's a dangerous vice for people. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. So I think that even though it is a thing, we as players just have to accept that. We get paid a lot of money to play this game. And I know these people, these fans, they want to make some money as well. It's definitely something that has kind of taken over the sporting world. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, I think a lot of those points there are are pretty well taken. I will just say, though, here's here's my new crusade. I, I do find a lot of cliches that have been around from the past. It seems like I can poke holes in a lot of them. For instance, money is the root of all evil. But is it, though? Because I would say, actually, the root of all evil is human beings, our very greedy nature. Also, was Adolf Hitler, for example, was money his primary motivation, arguably the most evil guy of all time. I don't know, just a thought there. But anyway, another one, just a real quick example. When people say hindsight is always 2020, is that really true, though? Because think about it. We're 10 years removed from the Frank Haith era, and Missouri fans can't even agree on whether he was a good coach or not. Some people think he was terrible. Some people think he was the best since Quinn Snyder. And, well, maybe they were both right. Did we ever consider that? But anyway, I digressed there a little bit, didn't I? Bottom line is, I actually agree with the NCAA for once. I think banning prop bets, at least on the legal level, hey, you can't control the mafia and the black market. I understand that element of it, but at least for my fa my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook and various other legal betting outlets that are all over the place these days, I think getting rid of those player props, at least at the NCAA level and again at the, the fringe level of NBA players, I think it's really the right move. It's not that big of a percentage of the volume either. You're not talking about a huge cut that these sports books are taking. I think, frankly, it's a necessary cut that they're going to have to take because at a certain point, they've got to realize that essentially these leagues are their partners at a certain point. What's good for these sports is good for these, these gambling partners and obviously what's bad for these sports. If the NFL was suddenly half as popular you know, in 10 years, that would obviously be a big, big time hit for people like FanDuel. So to me, keeping the integrity of the sport, making sure that especially the appearance of the integrity of the sport is intact is really, really paramount. And coming up, former Tiger Des Moy Hodge actually turned down a chance to be drafted in the NBA. Why would he do that? And in retrospect, was that a mistake 
on Hodge's part. Let's talk about that. And also I'll touch a little bit on Caitlin Clark being offered $5 million to play in the big three. But first let's talk about fire TV, your destination for sports from live games to highlights, to in-depth analysis, fire TV offers you so much on your smart TVs, as well as the fire TV stick that you can plug in to your existing TV gives you all types of content, including the world of sports, March madness, NBA, MLB, not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. And of course, Fire TV goes best with Amazon Prime, but you don't have to be a Prime subscriber to enjoy all of the great content and technology. Got to check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Just trust me on this. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash locked on. Fire TV. Drew King over at Power Mizzou had a nice story about Demoy Hodge and his journey in pro basketball so far. You may remember this past summer he signed as a free agent, an undrafted free agent with the Los Angeles Lakers. This was after the Minnesota Timberwolves informed Hodge late in the draft around the 55th pick or so out of about 60 picks in the draft that the T-Wolves would like to have selected him. But he ultimately turned that opportunity down in favor of signing with the Lakers. Apparently, LeBron James himself actually contacted Hodge saying, hey, I'd like you to give it a shot with my squad. And you know what? In retrospect, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, he made a mistake here in the comments of King's article here that I saw at least one person, let's put it that way, saying, well, you know, maybe he should have actually went to the to the Timberwolves after all. Well, again, this is another example of hindsight not always being 2020. In this case, yes, it's obvious that that Minnesota is better than the Lakers. That in, that in retrospect is obvious and clear. But w- does that mean he would have necessarily been a better fit in Minnesota? That I'm not so sure of. Would he have gotten as much of an opportunity in Minnesota? Again, I'm not so sure. With Anthony Edwards, maybe the best two-guard in basketball right now on the roster, playing essentially the same position as Demoy Hodge, I think he's frankly would have been a better fit in theory with the Lakers. I agreed with the decision at the time. Frankly, hard to turn down one of the great players of all time, basically saying, hey, I'd like you to give it a shot on my squad. I think if I were 22 years old, that'd have been tough for 23, however old Des Moines is. That'd have been tough for me to turn down as well. And on top of that, just the, the, the nature of how LeBron plays basketball slows it down offensively, keeps the ball in his hands as much as possible. Hey, it's worked for him, right? Hard to argue with the results. Not always the easiest guy to play with though, but To me, Des Moines Hodge, much of a a catch-and-shoot player, not really a put-the-ball-on-the-floor type of guy. To me, I thought it was a good good opportunity for him. Hopefully, eventually, Hodge did get waived by by the Lakers, you know, two or three months ago, something like that. So he's been grinding away in the G League, the NBA's minor league. So hopefully he gets another shot to be called up here eventually. Des Moines Hodge definitely... One of the great one-year players in Mizzou history. No question about that. And finally, I did kind of want to just touch a little bit on Caitlin Clark, the of course, the Iowa star women's basketball player, being offered $5 million by Ice Cube's The Big Three. Of course, they're traveling three-on-three basketball product that they put out there. And you know what? If I were Caitlin Clark... I got to say, that's one of those offers you'd be going, wow, five million bucks? Because if you look at it, quarter of a million dollars, 250000 is about what the highest paid WNBA player made last season. Now, obviously, Clark is reportedly making upwards, if not more than a million dollars this season at the University of Iowa with all of her various NIL deals that I'm sure that she has. Of course, we've been seeing her during March Madness 
along with Jake from State Farm on some commercials these days. I'm sure that was a nice payday for her. But so my point is she's got a ton of opportunities right now off of the court. So to me, if Clark goes to the big three, man, that is tempting because that five million bucks for her, that really would be a life changing amount of money for that young lady at this point in her life. But to me, I think if I'm Caitlin Clark, I'm playing the long game. I think I can make up that five million bucks off of the court eventually because I think I can make the WNBA a more popular product. All the people that have I've brought eyeballs now to women's college basketball. I think we're kind of in the transition phase here where eventually when pro football was eventually surpassed, excuse me, when pro football and pro basketball eventually surpassed the college versions in terms of popularity, I think that's eventually what we're going to see with women's basketball as well. So I think Clark will be a big part of that. And I think off the court, she's going to continue to have a lot of opportunities as long as she's an elite women's basketball player. To me, though, if she goes to the big three and suddenly starts playing against, you know, 46-year-old Joe Johnson or whoever, these guys who are former NBA players and stuff like that, what could that possibly look like? Could that be good for her? It just seems like if she's sort of, you know, if she suddenly isn't looking as, as much of the dominant player anymore, to me that hurts her brand. I think she's much better off simply just staying in the women's basketball lane and continuing to make that sport much more much more entertaining and to me the women's game has come an astonishingly long way just in terms of the skill level in the last decade or so I think Clark has been a big part of that and she'll continue to be so and my opinion hey smart publicity move by Ice Cube because everybody like people like me are talking about it but ultimately if you're Caitlin Clark just stick with women's hoops. You're going to make up that $5 million off the court and probably then some over the long term. So you know what? Hey, thanks for joining me here as always on this edition of Locked on Mizzou. And thanks for indulging that, frankly, non-Mizzou related topic here at the peak end of the show. And thanks for telling a fellow true son or daughter to go to LockedOnMizzou.com to find the links to YouTube, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, I'm John Miller, and this has been Locked on Mizzou.